It's my great delight to welcome three certified legends of the women's game. Julie Foudy, 274 appearances and 45 goals for the US women's national team. Her teammate for much of that time, Brandy Chastain, won 192 caps, scored 30 goals. Both were voted onto the US women's national team all-time best 11, two times FIFA World Cup champions, two-time Olympic gold medalists. Welcome to both of you from the States and thank you so much for joining us for the Australian Coaching Conference. How are you and how are things stateside? Oh, Steph, do you really want to ask that question? <laughs> Should we go in there? We don't want to start on this. Let's just say everything is fine. Nothing to see happening here in the United States. Good Lord. Uh, good Brandy, day, you agree? Good day. Good day. Oh, yes. Good day. Good day. Oh, good day. Good day every day. How are things? Fine. Everything's fine here. Fine. Well, the two of you are joined by someone you know so very well, a gentleman that has had a big role in shaping the careers and the futures of many of the women's players here in Australia. It's a very warm welcome to Tommy Samani, who, among other roles, <laughs> of course, he was two-time coach of the Matildas and the first coach to take an Australian national team to major international silverware, now head coach of New Zealand. But he joins us all the way uh, from his home, about 15 kilometres away in Sydney. Uh, <laughs> Tommy, how are you and what's it like being head coach of a team that you can't see and can't visit. It's actually very, very good. You don't have any problems. You, you, you're not dealing with players every day and, uh, and life is a lot easier. But uh, hopefully, it'll, hopefully it'll only be short-lived and we'll be back to normal again soon. Indeed. Well, uh, ladies, with respect to your wonderful uh, careers, and they are lengthy and, and much storied, and, and all three of you have much success at the top of the podium, I want to take you back to the 99ers. And uh, Julie, perhaps if we start with you, what was it that made that team so special? It was the second time you won a World Cup, but that group was absolutely amazing. Uh, I think the... The magic of it all was honestly, Steph, that we were hosting in our own country, of course, that we decided to put on a Women's World Cup in a fashion that had never been done in the United States before. Obviously, it was the first time hosting a Women's World Cup. They had hosted a Men's World Cup. And FIFA honestly wanted the women to do it on a smaller scale, keep it regional, just do it on the East Coast, keep it in smaller stadiums so you know you sell out. And from the very beginning, we as players, and thankfully our U.S. Soccer Federation said, no, we're going to host the first ever Women's World Cup in the United States in a fashion it should be hosted in big stadiums nationally, 80,000 seat football, meaning American football stadiums. And we're going to leave a national footprint on this country and, and really set the standard for what this should look like. Yet. We, of course, didn't know how the country would respond. We were still pretty young in our infancy, I think, in terms of um, how many soccer, true soccer fans we had in this country. I think it's very different today, you know, 20 plus years on. Uh, but we didn't know. We didn't know if people would show up. We didn't know how many would show up. It was a big risk. Um, but I think the magic, going back to my first point, is that we were able to pull that off in spectacular fashion. And more importantly, um, show what was possible in when you put on an event that's properly done with a lot of planning and a lot of people and a lot of marketing and a lot of effort that women could pull off the same type of energy that a men's world cup could generate you talked about being young julie and you were i think the second youngest in the side only mia ham at 19 was younger than you were you aware at the time that that was the start of a, a real watershed moment for women's soccer um, you know, I think, I think it didn't hit us at first. I think we knew that we had broken through in a sense that you know, everyone watched it, everyone was talking about it. It wasn't just your diehard soccer fans, which were very limited, as I said, at that point. Um, we knew we had touched a nerve, but we didn't understand what that would mean for women in soccer, for women in sports. And honestly, Steph, unfortunately, I think it took a long time still even after putting on such an event for women's sports to wrap their arms around the idea of putting on these big events and being able to showcase themselves in such a manner so i 
had hoped it would have been a faster catalyst for progress, honestly, <laughs> on the women's soccer side, women's football side. Uh, Brandy, how about for you? How do you recall that tournament? It was a bit of a roller coaster for you, and I was having a chat to Tommy about this last night. He wasn't aware that you'd actually scored an own goal in the quarterfinal against Germany. But then, of course, you came back, you know, one of those from zero to hero stories to score the equaliser in that same match and, of course, that winning penalty in the final uh, to take the title in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena in front of a home crowd. Was that your mental fortitude that allowed you to stay at at peak performance? Was it the team around you? Was it uh, wise words from coach uh, Tony DiCicco? Well, Steph, I think you're, that's a really loaded question, right? I mean, <laughs> if you think about the whole World Cup as a, you know, for me, coming back to the national team, former, I was on the 91 team and then I was dropped for the time in between uh, 91 to 95 and then coming back and playing a different position. So for me, you know, being there was a blessing. And I think one thing, you know, Julie kind of gave you the picture from like this 10,000 feet perspective, right? About the big stadiums and the amount of people and putting on these great and grandiose events. But, you know, when, when you talk about, when you ask me the question, when I think about that World Cup, these are the things that come up for me. Someone wrote them down ahead of time. <laughs> no, no. Uh as you were talking, I wrote them down because <laughs> for me, I think, I think, I think, I think the tournament doesn't happen the way it did. Uh, even if you have these big venues, if you don't have these things on the field, people will, might come for the first one, but they won't stick around for the long haul. And so I think the longevity of the team and, you know, getting to your question about, you know, sustaining the ability to have and downs during tournaments, um, is for the strong, it is for the prepared, it is for the, those who trust, it is for those who embrace team. And our team was truly uh, spectacular in, that, in those senses. And so um, if anybody at any time felt that they were wavering in those moments, the team was like you. So when, you know, Tommy, Tommy didn't know that I scored an own goal six minutes into the game in the quarterfinal match against Germany, uh, which could have been the most devastating moment in a career, right? Um, you're in the win and go on and lose and go home situation. And and I think with the weight of, you know, and we, we, we were uh, a sports psychologist at the time, and the weight of the external voices, which was the women's national needs to win the World Cup for the future of women's soccer, because we have all these people coming. And so if we don't win, then, you know, what happens after? I think that was probably more prevalent in, in our mind than it was what will happen after if we win the thing, to be honest with you. So, so that goal could have been really uh, disastrous. But luckily, um, the things that I wrote down on this note um, popped up right away. And Carla Overbeck came up to me right after the ball crossed the line. And as, a, as all good captains do, they know – the pulse of their their players know the things to say that's going to help and she said don't worry about it We're, we have lots of game left and you're going to help us win and not for one second longer did i think about the fact that i just put the ball into my own net and uh, that we were playing germany who probably was in the top three in the tournament and so um and then I ended up scoring another goal in that game, this time for our team, thankfully, which was great. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the rest goes on to history. But I, I just think that, you know, that final game was about two teams who were evenly matched, who were dead set on bending but not breaking. And they, they played the game the hardest they could in front of a crowd that was super appreciative of the whole tournament and couldn't have been more grateful to be in that stadium at that time. And Brandy, we have to ask you, the post-match celebration, uh, the match report reads, Chastain removed her shirt to reveal her sports bra. <laughs> that is an iconic moment. There's a statue now. <laughs> uh, did, you, did you know you were making history or was that just sheer excitement? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, if you ask Julie, that, that was a normal everyday post-training outfit that we wore because <laughs> we trained in Florida for the most part and it was hotter than Hades. So we, uh, we would... We would take our tops off just normally, but in that moment, it was. She likes to get naked. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah. oh, Tommy's blushing now. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, yeah. you, you, you also went yell about Julie in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also went down in history because I think FIFA brought in the yellow cards for women's re women removing their shirts after that particular right. tournament. Right. Right. Um, but you know, and all, and all. Can I, if I could say real quickly, Steph? I think in all seriousness, in that moment, I think what Julie was saying earlier about you know, you present something that's well developed and well thought out and well supported you can have greatness and i think in that celebration um what i what i hear from a lot of people and what i share is that you know young women and girls have not had not been given a, a platform to really show um their pride right and the things that they do and to celebrate the good things that they do and they've always kind of been told to be dem to demure themselves and to you know make sure you don't hurt anybody's feelings or you know don't stand out and that was not the point of that moment, but I think in that moment, a lot of people were inspired to say, it's okay to feel good about the good things you do. Because when you do that, it really trickles outward and it really impacts people for the better. And Tommy, uh, Tony DeChico, as I said, was coach of that side. He had an extraordinary group of women. And from talking to you, I, I'm getting the feeling he's someone that you admired as a coach and a man very much. Perfect. The first thing I want to say, I so wish I'd known Brandy had scored that own goal for the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy you didn't. Um, so, but, no, Tony was great. And, and, you know, during that period of time, I had the Matildas in that mid-90s period. And we, we ended up having a great relationship with the US. And, and, um, and through Tony, and he, was, he was so welcoming. And I think that that was all part of the environment of that team. And that team that made it so great. And in those days that, um, you know, the, the staffs from both teams used to get together. Uh, they were welcoming and bringing, I mean, we were just an Australian team from, from nowhere at that particular moment in time. And the way that Tony welcomed us as staff and me personally as a coach well, was just phenomenal. And, um, but I think that, uh, that kind of sums up the whole environment within the team. And even, you know, although we didn't have a lot of connection necessarily with the players at that time, you, you did sense amongst the US players that connection both on and off the field. And, and that was so critical about the team. So I think that 1999 team, which was probably 96 to 99, it wasn't just mm -hmm. 99, had that, that connection, you know, and, and, and I think from an outside, it was really obvious that it was a team that was, you know, people talk about it in cliches these days, but a team that was really close to each other, both on and off the field. And I think that was perhaps a significant, you know, thing that they did as a, as a group of players and as a staff. Yeah, ladies, Tony sadly, of course, passed away in 2017. And I believe that that whole team uh, travelled across to his, his funeral. Uh, was that a mark of the, the man and the, the loyalty that you felt towards him as, as his players? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, the thing about Tony that, you know, we loved as players is, um, as, as Tommy mentioned, right, there was a lot of joy and love amongst that group. It really yeah. felt like family. And that came in large part from the tone set from Tony. He would show up every day when we lived in Florida. We always had a residency before <laughs> World Cup or an Olympics for six months because this is prior to the leagues, professional leagues, of course. And um, he'd walk outside and it'd be a gorgeous day in Florida and he could like go, I love my job. And he'd shout up to the sky, you know? And we'd all respond, we love our jobs. Like, can you believe we actually get paid to do this? Um, always having us over at his house, his family became our family. They all I mean, beyond being an X's and O's technical tactical type of guy, similar to Tommy Sermani. I mean, the beauty of Tommy Sermani is he is a player's manager, right? They love him. They trust him. They know that he's got their back, and yet he's willing to push them. And, uh, and you know, we could go to Tony and say, hey, we don't like this. And he'd listen. He'd say, okay, but I disagree. Or, okay, thanks for that feedback. So there was just this constant open... Uh, communication that was so healthy and I honestly think beyond his time because back then it was like you tell the players what to do you're in control right as a coach and he was always like no I want to listen I want to hear how are things you'd be like thank you 
Okay. <laughs> Brandy, is that your recollection as well? Because, of, of course, Tony was in charge of uh, what has been coined as the golden generation of, of women's soccer players in the US. Uh, is that something that, that you felt that you were allowed to flourish as a player, but he also treated you as a person? Well, 100%. And, I, and Julie will attest to this, that when Tony came into the head coaching position for the national team, the team was completely different and played different and was m much more of a, uh, a destructive, defensive, um, just suffocate the other team kind of um, concept. And Tony wanted to make it more about soccer and, you know, about keeping the ball and playing the ball. And so for me, Tony actually was the resurrector of my career because he brought me back to the national team and he gave me a whole new position. And I, I thought, you know, in that moment when he told me that he wanted me on the team, but that I would be playing, going from a forward position to a defensive, a defensive position. First, I thought he was crazy. He had fallen down and hit his head or something. And then <laughs> I realized that, uh, I real, realized that he was, he had a, a lot of trust in me and that if he felt that, that I could do it, then I should believe that. So I think as far as the, the person Tony was there, there's no one who would is better than him. Like he, he was just a great person all around, great family guy. And he would come to practice and, and like Tommy uh, at Jules, um, he would play with us and it was a blast all the time. Like <laughs> He, he, he added a lot of comic relief um, and a lot of good times. So he made going out to the field uh, a lot of fun and yeah, enjoyable. I th I and think he was great at buying in on the pranks that we would pull on Brandy, which I owe Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, is there You're swearing allowed on Brandy. this program? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Julie's a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tommy, they're, they're talking about the, the playing at training, you tell me that your five-a-side record is, is pretty damn good, right? <laughs> never lost a five-a-side game. In his game. head. Never, in never his lost head. a five-a-side game in, in history. In my own mind. In my, uh, yeah. but he it, never lost a, hey, a five-a-side game when I was on his team, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> but probably one of the better things that Tony did was take you out the forward line and put you at the back somewhere, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tommy. Yeah, but, um, th it's really interesting now you actually brought that up about yeah. Tony. I have still got a magazine from 20 years ago where there's an article from Tony in there and, and he was talking about uh, expanding the, the football that the US team played because, again, you know, at, at, at those times the game was a little bit different and the US team, still as it is today, has a very athletic quality about it. But he was actually... Mm -hmm ahead of his time in the sense of saying that teams are going to catch up and teams are catching up. And uh, if we want to be a really, you know, truly champion team, we can't just be about athleticism. And he was talking back in those days, which is way ahead of his time, about how he wanted to play a much more expansive kind of uh, football with, with the US national team. And fortunately, he had the players to yeah. do that as well. Uh, Tommy, like Tony, uh, you're a qualified teacher uh, in the early parts of your of your career, and you had your first stint at Westfield Sports High uh, back in 1992. Uh, Brandy spoke about uh, how Tony moulded her and, and drove her in a different direction. You were at Westfield Sports High in the Harry Kuehl era. Uh, how important is it for a coach to be able to recognise when a player has that X factor and be able to guide them, uh, maybe in a direction that they weren't originally going? I think that's really part of the job and I think particularly in, in development and, and with certain players that often you can, they can get categorised as things and, and often there's a lot more in players than what, what you first see and I think one of the coach's jobs is to, is to look at players and look at their qualities and then be able to put those qualities in, in the areas that you think they can be best utilised and all that is also part of a coach's philosophy about how they want to play. Uh, and, and what kind of players that they actually want to have in their team. And when you first became uh, head of the Australian team in your first stint, not, not long after that, uh, one of your first things that you wanted to do was strike up that relationship with the US. Is that part of that to beat the best, you've got to play the best and so on? And were you aware of these ladies at the time? Um, I was aware of them uh, just in name alone. Mm. But you know, as I say, one of the, 
the critical things I felt was important to the progress of Australia was to, to link up with the team that was the best in the world. And a team that, you know, um, culturally we would have a, some degree of similarity. And um, so, you know, from 90, that when I was in that job from 94 to 97, I think we played the US team about six times. And uh, unfortunately it took us five games before we got a corner kick. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it was, uh, <laughs> but it was a really important foundation for us. And, and, um, and, and the, the great bit, and I'd actually left at this stage, is when the US team came out to Australia in, in 19, beginning of 1997 and played some games. And, but the, the other great thing, I think, for me and for our team was, again, to, to see that connection. And the game was different then. You know, you were, as I say, welcomed into the fold. Very first time I went to America, first thing I did with Tony, um, Julie's husband, Ian, that I worked with later, um, and Julie was play a game of golf, and, you know. But it was just that, just that environment was was, was so different, and it kind of doesn't exist, I think, anymore because perhaps the game has become more professional. People have become less trustworthy, you know, less trusting in each other, and and there's less of that connection than there was back then. And I think that's such a critical part of what made that team so successful. Were these ladies involved in your golf game? Uh, they, they weren't good enough at that stage to play golf. <laughs> I think April Heinrichs was in that round. April I'd be interested in to know how that uh, how that resulted. Uh, now, of course, you were coaching uh, men's club football in 1999. Uh, did something about this US team pique your interest? You, you say you knew their names. I mean, everyone knows Julian Brandy and Mia. Uh, is that something that resonated with you, even though you were, for that short stint, not involved in the women's game? Um, yeah, it did, because uh, even though I wasn't involved, I, I still followed it followed it closely and you know you couldn't not follow that World Cup you know in sense I think um, you know you talked about France uh, 2019 being probably the first global World Cup but I think 1999 as a World Cup was way way ahead of its time um, with the organization with the crowds with, with the whole thing um, and I think um, the US team epitomized what what that if you like way ahead of the time and what they, they epitomise what women's football has now become. Mm. And that cohesion in the team and uh, I want to know from your perspective uh, Julian Brandy how do you create that and I'll put a caveat in here my parents are Dutch so I grew up uh, half supporting a team that was a team of champions but not a champion team they couldn't get that cohesion together. Julie, you were captain uh, from 2000-2004 and co-captain for many years prior. Uh, what do you think the secret is? A lot of red wine helps, for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and cue cards. <laughs> and up for cute words. Um, and I just drink booze. Booze always helps. Um, I think uh, is uh, trust to Brandy's word, right? Like, but that takes, we used to always say that team chemistry is a, a verb, not a noun. It takes working on, it takes time. Um, I mean, we, we grew up on that national team together. We lived through um, parents' divorces and babies being born and parents dying. And, you know, all these phases of life and stages of life you usually go through with friends. We went through as national team teammates and we were always together. And so there was this love and trust that was real and it was something that we worked hard on. It was something that we valued immensely and understood. And in fact, you know, there's the story I always tell, Carla and I, the two captains, would go to Tony before he'd name a World Cup or Olympic team and say, we want to pick the last three players on the roster. And he'd be like, what? At first, he'd be like, what? And we would say, we want to pick players 18, 19, and 20. And we don't care what one through 17 are, but if we get those three right, then we're winning this World Cup or we're winning this Olympics. And it was true. Like, I can go back and look at those rosters from the game, from the tournaments and the championships we won, and there was a, a unity and a sense of purpose, a, a we is greater than the me in those groups that was built on, you know, look, I don't care what my role is. I don't care how many minutes I play. 
And yes, I want to be a starter, but if I'm not starting, I'm going to contribute and I'm buying in and I'm all in. And, um, and that takes, you know, believing in the people around you, I think. It doesn't just happen. You don't snap your fingers and that happens. Uh, Brandy, there's also a lot of uh, individual mental work that players have to do for themselves. And I know that you've spoken about that mindset and being able to have that mindset, not just for a match, but for moments in the match and knowing how to execute that at the right time. Uh, I believe you do some coaching yourself now. Is that something you can teach a player? Is that a, a teachable thing, a coachable thing, or is that something players just intrinsically have? I, I think there's a balance of both, right? Of course, if you're a competitor and you know you're driven to be challenged and you you embrace that environment, you, you can do you can have those skills. You know, there's some kids who I coach who might be a little more timid. I have one player specifically who, honestly, it was just a mute. Like she wouldn't say anything. She was very physically gifted, but honestly, was just kind of would take a back seat and. I've had her for two years now, and she came up to me before this whole COVID situation started, and she said, Coach Brandy, I've just, I've signed up for speech and debate. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, it was my proud coaching moment. Like, it had nothing to do with soccer, but, you know, it had everything to do with her finding herself, right? And so I think when, as leaders, we have the ability to empower our players um, with the notion that they could be great. And if you, if you understand who they are and how they operate, um, you can get them to do great things. And they can then see that they are in charge of those things and not just, you know, it's somebody telling me what to do. And, and so I, I feel like in our team, you know, the, the quality really came from the fact that it wasn't the amount of time that we trained but it was the quality of time that we trained and it was the quality of time that we spent together off the field. You know, we would, Julie and I and Mia and Christine lived in a house um, together. And, you know, in the morning you woke up, you could tell who was in a good mood. They probably needed an extra cup of coffee or, you know, and, and you pick up on those things. And so when that happens, you, you learn how to help each other, you know, you know, so, that, that environment is very um, ready for everybody kind of rising up, right? Because at some point you will be the support and some point you will need support. So it, it's very um, symbiotic relationship that we had with one another that really created uh, such a positive environment. Julie, Brandy and Mia living in a house together. Tommy, would you like to be a fly on the wall in that place? <laughs> I, I, I probably not. Uh, probably still well aware. Different suburb. It was, it was all, it was, yeah. <laughs> Especially after dark. Well. Especially after dark. <laughs> it was, it was it, you know, we had some good times. I, I loved um, the nights when we would all get together in the kitchen and it would be time to cook a meal. And Julie would be like, uh, what utensil is this? And like, she, she'd be like, okay, I'll just sit here and I'll drink the wine. That's fine. No problem. Girl after my own heart, Julie. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think those things are so important. And I think um, that the bit, somehow, again, probably because of the professionalism of the game, I don't think of that those connections off the field are quite as, um, as tight as they were back in, back in those days. And I think people underestimate how important that is, particularly for a national team, because when you're together, you're together. You're there 24-7. So um, the, the bits away from, from the football uh, become almost as important as the bits in the football. And I think, as I say, you know, though the highlights that Brandy and Julie are given it, it show exactly that. When you heard Julie talk about I think there's that. one more thing, Steph. Carry on. So if I can add, there's one, there's one other component that, we, you know, we're talking about all the good things, right? And I think there is also a time when Julie or somebody else on our team would have to get in the face of a player and say, it's not good enough or we need more out of you. And instead of that player becoming defensive, that player understood that that, that language and that communication came from a place of, of trust and respect, right? And so I think because of that, they could accept that information as just being information. It's not a personal attack. It's not, you're, you're not good enough. It's, it's actually quite the opposite. You are good enough. We need you. 
but you have to pull your weight. And so I think in our environment, that is also critical. Being able to hear those things and accept them was as important as just being there and being positive at the same time. And Julie, is that something that, uh, that's built on respect, I, I imagine? Uh, do you think that the, the players back then, the, the language was, it, it was much simpler, like it was a purer time for women's football. Now it's a big business and everyone wants to be a superstar. Do you think that that's something that's more difficult to do now? I mean, it is, you know, one of the pluses and minuses of, of moving forward with the game, right, is there's more coverage, there's more money, and all those things, which are good, right? I would never wish for it to go backwards, but it is another challenge. I think the other challenge, too, is just social media. We didn't have social media, right? And so everyone oh, is thinking, <laughs> first and foremost, I know, thank God is right. Uh, we would have been in jail. First and foremost <laughs> is you know, how can I brand myself? What is my brand? I mean, when you're thinking like that as a player, it's very different from our era of, you know, it's, it is, it was never about, and, and it helped also that your superstar in a Mia Hamm was as unselfish as they come, right? She didn't want the spotlight genuinely. She didn't care for the spotlight. Like she just wanted to be part of the team. Um, so I do think, but, but even with the social media challenges, I think the thing that frustrates me the most nowadays is you find coaches who will say, I don't have the time for that. I can't fit team chemistry or team building into the, you know, my, my training plan. And I'm like, bullshit, right? <laughs> the reason you fit it in is because you actually win. It's not just to do a little kumbaya around the campfire. Like the reason you do that stuff is you're better on the field. You can have those hard conversations to Brandy's point because the player knows it's coming from a place of love and they believe it and they trust it. Same with the coaches, right? It's much easier to take coaching and criticism from a coach who you know, in the end of the day, he still loves you. And so I think it's everything. And it's not just for women. I think it's for men as well. I think it's a mistake to say, ah, team chemistry is just for girls, right? I think it's a mistake. And we've seen that in sport after sport, team after team. Um, that it actually drives winning. It drives success. They're... You can tell I get all fired up about it. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, what, what's it like as a coach? Because uh, if, if players have egos, that, that's true also for, for coaches who sometimes don't want to uh, be told by their players what they should and shouldn't do, what they do and don't like. You know, Julie's saying that they uh, eventually came to that understanding where they would pick the last three players on the roster because it was important for that team harmony and that winning mentality. Uh, how do you see the players in, the, in that regard? What do they have to do to earn that sort of respect? Um, well, I think the important thing for the coach is to be comfortable enough to be able to have those conversations. I think, you know, and I certainly did when I went into coaching at first think, I'm here, I'm in charge of this, you know, what I say goes and, if, you know, Everybody will, will follow what I say, <laughs> which you soon find out doesn't happen. And I, and I think it takes you time and you have to, you have to trust your own abilities to be able to, to sit down and, and, and listen to, to players and, and to then assess what needs to be done with that. The, the, the challenge from a lot of coaches' perspective is that by doing that, there's a sense that they maybe feel that they're losing authority in doing it. And, um, and the, the devil is in the detail of managing to, to balance both. And, um, and as I say, part of that is, I think, being comfortable in the job that you're doing. And, and part of it is believing in, in the art of communication and feedback and, and not being, um, sort of, if you like, too precious or, you know, to, uh, not precious is not the right word, but as coaches, you know, we're kind of, you, you can become very insular uh, as a coach and you can become untrusting as a coach um, so it's been able to sort of balance all of those all of those things out and um, and as I say being generally just being comfortable in the job that you do. And coaching of course is such a tenuous position I mean we know from the landscape here in Australia that it can be very very short-lived. You shared a, a little nugget of gold I don't know if these ladies are aware of it that you did have a role where you have a hundred percent success. Yeah I, I, I was a, an A-League co coach for 14 hours uh, back in 2011. Uh, if I won't go into the details of it. I never met the players. I was never on the football field. 
Um, and uh, I was never anywhere near the club, but I had a perfect record for 14 hours. <laughs> That's an A-League record. You had a You're pretty a good... genius. He is, isn't he? <laughs> Unbelievable. Never put a foot wrong. The, the art of coaching remotely is, uh, <laughs> yeah. seems to be a Tommy Samani specialty. Uh, you were very much hands-on, though, when you went over to coach the US women's national team. Uh, tell us about that experience and, and how the philosophy, if you like, was different for the team over there to say when you coached Australia or was at Canada or New Zealand? We've gone straight from the opposite to the, my very successful <laughs> spent for 14 hours to the opposite. Um, it, was, it was different. There was things that I should have done differently and done better, if I'm being perfectly honest. Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge for me, and, and even at that age, as I was getting older then as well, uh, was that you learn as you go along and you, you continue learning even as you get into old age that um, I went from a, an environment in Australia where I basically had the, the trust of the people that, that employed me to, to do the job and, and to, to be able to run the job and, and to work as I, I normally work into a very different environment, a very different organisation, um, you know, very different staff set up, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and you know, in, in essence, sort of, uh, my management style probably needed to be adjusted to, to do that better and some decisions that I needed to make which I probably would have made in time because I didn't think, um, you know, I, th I thought I had time, um, I, I probably didn't make quick enough. So it was just, uh, it was a, a, a really interesting learning experience for me. Uh, Julie and Brandy, you know that we've just had a new coach appointed to the women's team here. Uh, as a collective group, how difficult is that when the coach changes? Sometimes it's uh, due to perhaps player revolt, sometimes it's administration and, and the federation that makes that decision, but it's ultimately the team that has to adapt to a new style. Um, how tricky is that going to be for the, particularly for the Matildas, you know, heading into an Olympics and Asian Cup and then a home World Cup? Uh, Jules, if you don't mind, I'll start. Um, I, th I, I think that, you know, change is, is something that happens in life a lot. And so for those players who are agile and flexible and open-minded and confident, change in this situation will be really good because it's a new opportunity. I, I see change as a new opportunity. And so um, you have an opportunity to be your best self. There's nobody, you have a blank slate. So I, I honestly believe it, it could be the best thing that happened. Um, but I'm an optimist about change. And so having been in a situation where I was with one coach, got cut from the team and came back to a new coach, you know, I, I always see those as one door closes, another opens. Julie? Yeah. I, I also think that a new voice Sometimes I know there has been some turmoil in the coaching uh, rotation through uh, Austria, through the Matildas, uh, through the women's team. But I do think in Tony Gustafsson that you've got a really good coach who knows his tactics, who understands how to win at the highest level. I mean, he he ran that team with Jill Ellis, right? He has been at World Cups. He has been at the highest level. He's been at Olympics. He knows what it takes. And um, and he largely engineered a lot of that with the U.S. team as well. I mean, he uh, was very hands-on. So I actually think it's going to be a, a great change because uh, you get someone that knows what it takes to win at the highest level. And I feel like, I mean, so much of what we talk about, Steph, today with the 99 World Cup coming, it was the first time we'd hosted a Women's World Cup. I mean, there's such a parallel to what's going to be happening in Australia and New Zealand in 2023, right? I mean, finally, they give it to Australia and New Zealand. It took way too long, I think, on FIFA's part to announce that. But you have this opportunity with already an interest and a curiosity in the game in Australia and a really good, I mean, in New Zealand, sorry, Tommy, but a really good <laughs> team that has a shot at actually winning that World Cup. And what that can do to transform women's soccer in that country is gonna be remarkable. And, right. and I think one more thing about, about situations like this is the willingness to give a little bit, right? So you, you know, if, you, if you get stuck in your ways, you, you will find yourself being 
left behind. And kind of to what Tommy was talking about, you know, because it's, something's been successful in the past doesn't mean it will be successful going forward. And so I think for the players, it's a, it, again, it's that opportunity to learn and grow. And for the coach, it's actually a, an opportunity to learn and grow. And so together, they have an opportunity to do something that no one's ever done before. And, and so that is very exciting. As Julie said, this is uh, truly an exciting time in women's football. Tommy, agree? Yeah, agree. I, and I think Tony's a, is a great appointment. Uh, I think he has both the, the, obviously he's got the technical skills as a coach. He's coached the highest level players in the world. So he's got that um, credibility behind him. But I think he's also able to talk football in a way that will really um, resonate with the Australian players. How important is it that uh, coaches who are coming down under, and of course Tony is uh, going to remain in, in Europe to, to a large extent, at least initially because of the border closures, uh, how important for them is, to, is it to understand the Australian mentality? It, it's critical. I think that's one of the things that, you know, I've been a coach that's gone into lots of different countries uh, and, and I've seen a lot of situations where coaches come from particularly established football countries <laughs> and they go into what appears as not established countries like the US, like New Zealand, like Australia, and they feel that um, they bring that culture to the, that particular country, which is a huge mistake. I think it's really important for the a, a coach going into any country that he actually, he or she understands the culture of that country and what's within those parameters. And of course, there's extra pressure uh, for you should you be in the role with New Zealand for a home World Cup and for Tony leading into 2023. Uh, ladies, you were here in, in 2000 for the Sydney Olympics. Uh, how did you feel that, that vibe over here? Because our feeling is that the celebration is going to be as huge when we have the Women's World Cup here. Oh, Do you remember it? I <laughs> love the Olympics in 2000. Oh, yeah, um, it was awesome. As a matter of fact, I, I have here. <laughs> uh, rub it in. <laughs> that was nice one. wrong color, though. That it's the wrong the color, silver. yeah. <laughs> Juliet, Juliet, we don't, we don't talk about people who come second. <laughs> <laughs> My family still to this day is like, oh, we just want to like freeze time and just be in Sydney at the harbor. I mean, they had. Um, which we later discovered they had uh, as part of the U.S. Olympic House setup, they had this friends and family AT&T village like that took over a restaurant and a big area of the Sydney Harbor. So literally, I did not see my family that entire Olympics. They stayed drinking with the Aussies. <laughs> I mean, they were anywhere except around us. I was like, where have you guys been? They're like, this place is amazing. We're not, we're not going home. <laughs> so yes, I am that it's going to require a year of research and prep for the 2023 World Cup. I'm coming over for the entire year. Oh, listen so. to you. Uh, nice. I'm going to be. I'm going to hopefully get a job with Julie then, if that's the case. Well, well of course you've both, you've both got experience in broadcast media, so I'm sure you can you can swing that. But uh, further to what I asked Tommy about that Australian mentality, uh, as players, you've both made many Australian friends and uh, we have a, a group of mutual friends of course that we all know but what was your opinion of the way Australians approached football the way they played and their mentality? Well I, I had two two Australian teammates with the San Jose Cyber Rays uh, Julie Murray and Diane Aligich and I mean Julie Murray is a world-class player and Diane was a young player coming up and both of them possessed uh, what I feel was honest, um, earnest hard work uh, as their foundation, that they came every day to you know, be as tough-minded as they could be and to, to not be an easy target, uh, you know, not get beat on any play. And so that, was, uh, that, that helped our team have a lot of, uh, I think, grit and, and determination. But they also have such a funny accent that they made it fun. You know, that was like, that was, that was part of the fun. No, they had such great, you know, fun, like Tommy, you know, he, he brings a lot of sayings to the, to the, to the conversation. And, 
and overall their their attitude was um, they love team they love to be there but they were super hard working but I, I just want to say that I think there's there's a caution to all of this right the expectations are going to be very high everybody's going to have this we want to win this whole thing mentality and and that is excellent you have to have that dream and that out that reach out in front of you um, but I want to throw this out to them and say, you're going to miss some and you're going to fall down a little bit and you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to be resilient. And I feel that these players will have that, but I just, I don't want the fans. I don't want the people who are seeing this great opportunity as if we don't win the whole thing, it, it won't be a success. But I want them to see this as you're building something so incredible. And, you know, it, I think back to 99 and we were down 1-0 to Nigeria in Chicago in the second game in the group stage. And we all kind of got shocked there for a minute. So um, then you find out what you're made of, right? You find what, what you're made of in those tough moments. So um, I, I want them to embrace those tough moments as, eagerly as they will embrace the, the fun that it will be to host something as amazing as a World Cup. Julie, is the success uh, integral to enjoying the tournament? <laughs> it does kind of come in. <laughs> um, it's just part of the pressure, right? I mean, we felt that a lot in 99. And, um, you know, that would be the first thing I would say to, you know, a Sam Kerr or in any of those players who feel like, oh my gosh, this is our chance, is that you have to, as the great Billie Jean King once said to me, pressure is a privilege, Fowdy, as I was before the 99 World Cup saying to her, oh my gosh, there's so much pressure for us to be successful so that we keep generating enthusiasm and the fans keep coming. And she's like, pressure is a privilege. I was like, yes, yes, it is, you're right. So understanding that pressure is going to be there and being, to Brandy's yeah. point, being good with it, right? Like that's a huge, huge part of our success in 99 is we just wrapped our arms around it. We were like, let's go. We've got this. We're going to have fun with this. We're not going to, we're going to be serious when we step over that white line. But I mean, the night before our opening game of the World Cup, we threw a huge prank on Brandy that um, was hysterical. <laughs> You know, that's how we kind of prep for that. It was so hysterical. <laughs> hysterical. Come on, you've got to tell us what it was. <laughs> so Brandy oh, made the unwise decision to pose naked on a magazine cover before the World Cup. Because like I said, Brandy likes see to the naked, see right? the See the thing, see the things I would do <laughs> to promote and, women's football and yeah. to help our so, team. I sacrificed she got myself. Into this, like, she got into this like kind of crouched pose naked with a soccer ball, but the best part was her face. She was like, <laughs> I had a Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> look, look, there's, there's uh, a whole generation was, of Matildas on a calendar that would like sympathize. That. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly. A, a video of, of posing naked in different like posed fetal positions of uh, with soccer balls. And she l used to love like Tommy to do crosswords. So we, cover our, our chest and crossword puzzles and uh, we did a whole video and uh and pretended like there was this big feature on the team that was coming out the night before the opening game come on everyone come in and tony of course was in on it to chico and then we <laughs> we rolled our our spoof of her naked it was so good, so good. So, oh my god can you see you see steph why things were uh we were able to do the things we could do because we could take that kind of stuff and we could make fun of things and we could have a good time with it and nobody would be nobody would be scarred for life you know what i'm saying they wouldn't they wouldn't be scarred for life from something like that brandy it made you a stronger person right i, I think if no. i'd seen that photo, I, I, I'd be I thought it was for life. hilarious <laughs> I think I'd, if i'd seen the photo I'd well be scarred i'm not for pulling life. it out tommy i'm not okay. pulling it out thank you, thank you. <laughs> find it and have it readily available to be just like here it is <laughs> yeah good we'll include that in the papers after oh, the conference uh, yeah. <laughs> tommy that sort of camaraderie does that exist now in the teams that you're seeing and there's this modern generation we're talking about the australian side potentially being that golden generation yeah. that we saw in the 99ers in the us I, I think it's getting tougher i think it's getting tougher generally to to 
to be like that. I think the game has has changed a bit in the sense that um, the the individual um, is perhaps not necessarily becoming bigger than the team, but you know, big, there's more emphasis on it than there there is the team. There are certain things that you could do around a team those days that if you do today and, and suddenly we talk about social media, it gets out in social media, it has a negative impact and, and all those kind of things. So there's things that you could do back in those days that were a lot easier to do. And and generally, you know, and generally there was um, probably a better balance between what you did off the field and what you did on the field. And as I say, as the game becomes more professional, <laughs> people become a bit more serious, it becomes more difficult to have those kind of moments. Mm, and we are in an age where uh, people are very, Tommy, very serious. Tommy, we were very serious. What are you talking about? We were very yeah, serious. Yeah. We also I, live I think in also, it. I think also one thing that's happening is that people are, you as island nations, you know, right? The players are now separated. They're yeah. in different parts of the world. So we were with each other all the time. And that certainly helped, you know, that cohesiveness and proximity to each other definitely made it easier in, in that way, but it's absolutely attainable, without a doubt. Mm. I, I feel that you can you can have the same kind of camaraderie, uh, but the players and the leaders uh, have to work on it, as Julie said. Yeah, and Tommy, you of course gave a lot of the current side their start. You, you know them from, from when they were just young teenagers through to here. Have they got that what it takes? I, I, yeah, I do. I, I think, you know, an interesting thing, a story, the one of the, the guys with the US national team, Aaron, Aaron Heifetz, who's, who's been there since year dot and is a media guy, still there, Great, you know, a legend in, in their environment, <laughs> is that um, one thing he said to me is that the US, when he was with the US team, is that the team that he always feared playing against were the Aussies. He said because the Aussies were the only team who thought they could beat the US, uh, whereas they felt a lot of other countries would come up against the US and just freeze and, and be beaten before they went on the field. And I think there's still that attitude. And I think when I look at this current Australian team, when the Sam Kerr's, Caitlin Ford, uh, Alana Kennedy, Steph Catley, et cetera, et cetera, came into the team as teenagers, um, they had that mentality already. They really didn't care. Uh, I remember before we played the World Cup in 2011, uh, Caitlin Ford was playing against Marta in the first game and she didn't even know who Marta was and, and most importantly she didn't really care she just shrugged her shoulders and said well that's okay and I think that they've, they've got they had that mentality from a young age and they're now you know professionals playing at the highest level so they do they've got both I think the winning mentality and the confidence and the toughness to actually you know do yeah, I hate to say win the World Cup because you can never predict who's going to win a tournament, but they've certainly got the ingredients to be able to win it. It's interesting what you say about uh, Caitlin not knowing who Marta is and uh, for legends like uh, Julian Brandy, it's, it's an interesting conundrum, isn't it? Because it's so huge in women's soccer circles and I just think that sometimes we don't pay enough respect to the history of the game. Do you feel like... Uh, players from your generation are uh, in, enveloped and, and included in uh, sharing your history and sharing your experiences with football moving forward? Mm, a good yeah. one. That's Brandy, you want to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, know, I, I think there's definitely a... Yes. <laughs> uh, I think there's a degree of, of that, but I also think there's sometimes... The, um, you know, a degree of wanting to be able to get away from that as well. So, you know, I think there's a healthy dose of it. Um, in my, in, for me, I would love to be in all the time. You know, I, I want to be around it all the time. I want to influence it. I'd love to be coaching in that environment and, and helping share the lessons that, that I learned, that I got from Julie, that I got from Carla, Mia, Joy, Christine, and, and so on. Uh, because those are valuable. If you don't know where you came from, it's very difficult to be able to drive yourself towards something um, better, right? And so I think that's critical. Uh, but I think there's there's a wholesomeness about not knowing, like you said, Tommy, um, that allows you to have the freedom to be expressive on the field and to 
make things happen. Um, so I think having a, a good dose of both is important. Julie, do you agree with that? Yeah, and, but I think you have to know your history, right, in anything. I wouldn't just say that about sports. I mean, I look at what we're living through right now and look at what um, we've learned historically, whether it's sports, whether it's life, whether it's war, whether it's religion, right? And you have to learn and be wiser and know that there was a reason we went through that. And so um, I think when I see, for example, in France this past summer for the Women's World Cup, uh, actually 2019, when I see the French team and uh, interacting, some of the players that were of my generation interacting with the current team, it like warms my heart that there's this thread that runs through it, right? Because that's important. It's important to understand it's a family and you learn from the people who've come before you and you stand on their shoulders in anything in life. And Tommy, does that work the same in the in the coaching ranks? Uh, would you expect someone taking over a team to ask you what your experiences were, or do you need to put your own stamp on it? I, I think for coaching it's probably slightly different. I think you, you you kind of need to go in and put your your own stamp on on things and manage things as you you're going to manage them. But I think at the same time, it, it's important to respect coaches that have come before you and and coaches that are you know have been in the game for a, for a long time, whether it's your job or just in the game in general. I, I think it's really important to to respect the role that, that coaches have done in the past. And how about bringing through female coaches? And we heard Brandy touch on that before. Uh, why aren't there more female coaches? Is that just a metrics thing? That the pool is just not as big? Are we doing enough? Um, I think there's a lot of different factors in it. I think one is that the women's game's only now just becoming professional uh, in, in a sense. And it's still, it's still, in essence, compared to the men's game, a young game professionally uh, and I think it's, it's not long ago where players weren't getting paid at all to play for the national teams and, and generally players played, played football but they had a, a proper job so you know when it became 28, 29, 30 or whatever they felt they had to get on with their life so they, whereas male players have been brought up professionally all the way through and it's just kind of an extension of that to go into coaching. Um, I think, and, and I think it's a reality, it's a really tougher job in a sense in women, and I, I don't I hope this doesn't sound the right way, but, but men just get up and take <laughs> off. Well, they do. We just get up and they, we're more irresponsible in a way. We just get up and we take off. And the, the women's expected at times, particularly in the family situation, to be the person that looks after the family. And, and a coaching job d does not suit a family environment. Um, so it becomes much more, I think, much more difficult for females to, to, make, to make that step. And, um, and again, but I think that's changing. And, and as the game becomes more professional, you'll start to see more professional coaches coming through the ranks. But I think the other thing, and this is one of my soapbox things, is that we, we tend to say we need women's coaches. And I had this argument in Australia when I was a coach, about we need to get women's coaches involved with the national team. And the thing that you need to do in conjunction with that is you need to get a critical mass of female coaches. So you need to get coaches of females coaching at all the different levels and you need to get numbers. And then the numbers eventually filter through and then you get the coaches coming through at the top level. But even in saying that, if you look at a lot of the national teams now, there is a high percentage of coaches that are now female. So there is a lot of female influence in the game and certainly much more than it was just a few years ago. Julian Brandy, you had male and female uh, head coaches. Did you have a preference? Did it matter or was it just the coach themselves? I don't think it mattered to me. Um, it was yeah. the coach themselves. I will say for sure, I don't know about Australia, but for sure in the United States, there's no pipeline for women to become coaches, mm. right? It's not that... Uh, that it's for lack of interest. I just think we're not planting that seed. We're not showing them that it is possible. We're not mentoring them along, right? And there's so much work to be done in that space. If we said to young women coming out of college, if I had someone while I was playing on the national team say, hey, do you want to get your coaching license while you're playing? Huh, can I do that? Yeah, right? Plant that seed with players and 
all of a sudden we'll start creating a pipeline for women to actually get that experience. And then they have a group of mentors that are around them that can help guide them through. And we don't have that. And I'm sure it's very similar in Australia. We definitely need to create that because there are women that could be fantastic coaches that aren't just coming to the profession. They're going elsewhere. Yeah, we've also experienced something else uh, because we have such a, an incredible feeder system through the collegiate ranks. Um, you know, the, the Division I uh, programs that exist here in the United States is 325 plus. And if you look back in history, Julie says we have to know our history, um, the percentage of women coaching women was very high. It was like in the 70s. And now in this day, it's in the teens. And so that's that's an unfortunate shift, but I see that the reason why that is because now coaching women has become more more lucrative, and it's become, and so coaches are taking are, you know, we're not driving women to those, and it, they're being seen as being very valuable in, in terms of having a, an occupation. So um, we have to show these young girls that those positions do and could belong to them. Um, and we do need those role models to be accessible. Um, and we need organizations that that drive that message too. It's so US soccer, for example, um, you know, we have to drive that message to our players. You want to become a coach, we will certainly help you. Yeah. And, and I think that's dead right. But I think if, if I look at here in Australia, is that the, the kind of flip the pyramid and, and look at starting it from the top downwards, whereas you've got to start it from the foundation and build up that mass of coaches. And that's a great point about going on the licenses, getting that background in the game and, and going through the process that you need to go through. Um, and, and, and it's really important that organisations become involved in, in, as part of that process and driving it. Uh, ladies, we are at a coaching conference. Can you perhaps define a, a pertinent moment in your careers where a coach has made a difference? <laughs> I've had coaches that made a difference at every level. level. I, I worked with Tommy. He was uh, a great uh, shoulder to lean on and a great support system. I, I feel Tony DiCicco, like I said earlier, really resurrected my career because he was willing to see something in me that somebody else didn't. Uh, I think the coaches that had the ability to listen and understand and see their players and then gain their trust were the most successful that I experienced. Julie? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I had a coach in Anson Doran's our first national team coach who said to me, I respect talent, but boy, do I admire courage. Meaning, let's see a little more courage, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then there was, you know, Tony's style of, um, yeah, I, I want I want this to be a, a, a relationship that's, you know, that's give and take and give and take and understanding that as a, a leader and a captain and what that means about life and all of those things off the field as well. So, I mean, I think the best coaches are the ones who don't just, as I said earlier, teach X's and O's. They actually teach you about life, right? And um, and those are the ones we remember for the rest of our life, who actually care deeply about you being a great human, not just a great athlete. Mm -hmm. Tommy Samani, you're a wise man. What's your uh, highlight of your coaching career that you think I made a difference there? Oh, I, I, uh, that's a good question. I wasn't expecting that question. Well, maybe it hasn't uh, happened yet. It hasn't, yeah, probably <laughs> hasn't. Yeah, haven't. So hopefully haven't ruined too many lives. I think that's probably the... Uh, the case. Look, I, I think the thing that gives me satisfaction, as they say, it, it's not the football, it's how I've seen lots of players come through at the other end and still having a relationship with those players. I, I think that's been the most rewarding thing for me. You know, I'm not a, a, an X and O guys. I don't look back and say, we won that, so that was, bit was good. We lost that, that bit was bad. Um, for me, it's, it's been about um, a kind of a life journey and people that I'm still connected with after 30 years, like these two suspect characters at the other end of the Zoom, um, <laughs> that those for me are the most valuable things um, and the things that I value most out of my, out of my sort of football journey, basically.
And it speaks a lot to the, the relationships that all of you have built throughout your careers, throughout the years that you can still pick up the phone to each other and, and pick up where you left off yesterday. Uh, to all three of you, you've had such a huge impact on the women's game and it's been so wonderful to share your stories. We could probably talk forever, uh, uh, but we'll have to uh, have, a, have an episode two at some point. But I just want to say thank you so much to the three of you uh, for joining us for the Australian Coaching Conference for 2020. Uh, we really appreciate the two of you in the States taking the time out of your day. Tommy, you're here in Sydney. And to all of you, look forward to seeing you in Australia and New Zealand in 2023. Fantastic. Thank you. Woo Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Great to catch up.